What is a thought? It is easy to take for granted things that are familiar. Your thoughts are familiar, but they are far from insignificant. Why does reality include such things as thoughts? What are thoughts? When I was in college, I had a conversation with a friend about this very question. My friend suggested that thoughts are immaterial entities inside one's soul. While I wasn't opposed to the idea, I wasn't so sure. I replied that thoughts might be complex patterns of particles. Maybe we have no idea now how to make a machine that could actually think. But that doesn't mean that there isn't some sufficient or correct complexity of machinery that could generate an actual thought, I said. My thinking about thoughts, however, transformed in graduate school as I studied the philosophy of mind in more depth. After reading many books and articles, at least one thing became evident to me from many angles. It became evident to me that there is some difference between a first-person experience, like the experience of thinking a thought, and a purely third-person description of a brain. If you see some neurons from inside Bob's brain, for example, you do not thereby see what it feels like to be Bob thinking about cheese pizza, if that's what he's doing. Now, to be clear, different descriptions can be about the same reality. In fact, I think you are one thing and that different descriptions of you describe different aspects of you, such as your occupation, your genetic makeup, your brain, and so on. Now, philosophers have provided various ways of analyzing these different descriptions of you. Some think first-person aspects of consciousness, like the feeling of seeing a red tomato, are not even real. I once read an article that expressed the belief that there are no beliefs, or any other first-person realities. These philosophers are eliminativists. Others say that your first-person sense aspects are real, but they actually are third-person material aspects of brains. These are the reductionists. For my part, I am sympathetic with John Searle's analysis when he says that reductionism fundamentally amounts to the same thing as elimination. It's like saying the heads of a coin just is the tails of that coin. In that case, what you thought of as heads isn't really there. Similarly, if the reductionists are right, then what you think of as your own thoughts aren't really there. However, we are stepping into extremely complex conceptual terrain, and reasonable people can disagree. There are many avenues to explore here. Some avenues take you into a forest of concepts in the philosophy of language, while others lead you into labyrinths in epistemology. In this video, I want to present to you a new tool for investigating the nature of thoughts. This tool comes from an idea I had one morning while eating a bowl of Rice Krispies. In a flash, I had a picture of a conceptual landscape of ideas, overlaying a material landscape of shapes. I then began imagining different ways of changing the conceptual landscape versus different ways of changing the material landscape. This picture was a seed for a new kind of argument from counting against reducing the conceptual to the material. I later developed the argument, presented it at conferences, and then published a few different versions of it. I will give you a brief introduction to the idea here, leaving open various ways you might develop it further. So to illustrate the basic idea, imagine you have an infinite pile of random Legos. You can use these Legos to build any Lego tower you would like. Simply combine pieces together in different arrangements. These Lego towers represent logically possible material configurations. I will now show how there could be even more conceptual configurations. First, we use concepts as our building blocks. For each Lego piece, there is a concept of that Lego piece, like the concept of a particular blue square. These Lego concepts are like Lego pieces for building thoughts. From these concepts, we can identify a logically possible thought for every possible Lego tower. Call these thoughts the tower thoughts. For every logically possible tower, there is a logically possible thought about that tower. We are now ready for the key that unlocks the argument. The key is in the nature of concepts, which supplies us with conceptual relations, like or, that can link together any tower thoughts to form an additional logically possible thought. For example, there is the thought that a particular Lego tower is my favorite tower, or that some other tower is my favorite. In this way, we can define a thought for every class of towers. For every class of towers, there is a logically possible thought about that class. Now, both the class of thoughts and the class of towers are infinite. But, by Cantor's theorem, the first infinity is larger because there are more classes of towers than individual towers. 
Therefore, it follows that the logically possible thoughts outnumber the logically possible LEGO towers. In other words, there are more potential conceptual configurations, configurations of thoughts about LEGO towers, than potential LEGO configurations. This all follows from Cantor's theorem upon reflection on the ways that we can build thoughts from more basic concepts of LEGOs. What does all of this mean? Well, if the LEGO argument is sound, then there is a more general problem with reducing thoughts to material states. After all, the structure of the argument applies not just to towers of LEGOs, it also applies to towers of atoms, and towers of quarks, and arrangements of superstrings, and any pattern or function of particles or fields. The argument applies to any purely third-person, non-conceptual aspects of material states. For any third-person material reality, there is a logically possible first-person conceptual map of that material arrangement. Moreover, for every class of these maps, there is a perfectly logically possible thought about that class. If all of this is right, then by Cantor's theorem, we get a big result, namely that the logically possible thoughts outnumber the logically possible material realities. And that implies that the conceptual terrain is not reducible to the material terrain. In other words, the conceptual aspects of your thoughts are not entirely material. For more details on this argument, including my discussion of various objections, I refer you to the links in the description of the video. Whatever you think about this argument, the opening question remains, what is a thought? If a thought is not reducible to the material aspects of a brain, then what is a thought? I would like to conclude this video with a proposal for your consideration. My proposal is that a thought is fundamentally just what it seems to be from the first person perspective. When you have a thought in your mind, like a thought about water, you can inspect that thought and see some of its aspects. For example, you can see that your thought about water has the aspect of being about water. When you see this aspect from the first person perspective, you are seeing something real. And this reality is fundamentally just what it seems to be and not something else. The nature of a thought is most clearly visible from your own first person vantage point. Now, whatever you think about this proposal or about the nature of your thoughts, your thoughts are powerful. I hope this video serves you. Thanks for watching.